morning, everyone. Good morning. And I'm telling you, it's really nice to be back here with you all in person. I miss you all when I'm not here in person, but I'm really thankful that the Lord has blessed us with this facility that I can, you know, be live, interactive with you when I'm not here in person. But it's really great to be with you this morning. Let's, let's be in class with, with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful for you and for Jesus and for all that you've done for us. We ask that your spirit will join us today. Finish the work you've begun in each of our hearts. Make us more effective at this time in human history to take the, the healing and saving message about you to this world. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So I just want to remind you, I'm down at the Honey Lake Clinic, and I'm the medical director down there. And this is a holistic Christian residential treatment program, the only one in the country that is a residential Christian psychiatric treatment. And that means people will stay four to six weeks on campus in a resident setting uh, to get psychiatric treatment, not substance treatment, even though we do comorbid substance. It's not a residential substance program. It's a residential psychiatric treatment program with a holistic Christ-centered approach. And we are just having an incredible positive outcomes with people. And uh, the leadership team down there has decided that from now on, all the new patients coming in, they, they receive a welcome bag as they come to the campus. They will, will, in their welcome bag, get a, could it be this simple, a Remedy Psalms and one of our little bookmarks as they come in to the, to the campus. So, it's the, yes, it is excellent, and I think it's going to have a very positive impact on people because you know the healing message and how helpful the, the, these truths are. We are still looking for Christ-centered, licensed uh, uh, counselors to expand the program. So if you know anybody who shares this vision and wants to be part of our team, have them contact the Honey Lake Clinic, and maybe we can get them on our team. We're doing lesson number four in the quarterly, God's Mission, My Mission. And the title is Sharing God's Mission. And the memory verse is from John 13, 34 to 35, and it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, I know you've heard that before. <laughs> yes. But when Jesus told his disciples to, to love one another, a new command I give you, that you must love one another, this did not mean he was actually teaching them a new concept, idea, principle, directive, instruction that God had not previously given them. He meant it was new to them. This is new to you. You don't know this. But Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18 say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your souls and all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This had already been told them. But somehow, they didn't know it. It was new. Despite God's previous revelations in Scripture and their part of the Jewish nation and having been studying the scriptures, they somehow didn't know God's command was to love. What about us today? I don't think there's a Christian who hasn't heard the memory verse before. That God has told us to love. But could this command be new to some of us or all of us? Not the words the meaning. Could we have a similar struggle that the disciples had? Well, let's talk about this idea of love. Where does this love that we are commanded to have originate? Okay. Yeah, good. So are we able to produce this love because Jesus has commanded us to? No. It's something he has to do in us. Is this love something we have within ourselves and we, can, we only need to have better psychological attitude and choose to love? Or is it something that only comes from outside of ourselves and we must choose to receive it, be transformed by it, and act in harmony with it? Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Jesus gives more insight into this in John 15, starting in verse 9. This is what Jesus said. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from my Father I have made known to you. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. The first truth that Jesus tells us is that love originates in God. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Love originates in God. He is the source of love. It flows amongst the Godhead. Father, love to the Son, and through the Son, the love comes to us. We do not possess this love in and of ourselves, but we receive it as we receive the sunshine. It constantly, God's love is constantly shining down on us, just like the sun is constantly shedding and shining its beams down on us. Yet, just like the sunshine, which never stops streaming from the sun, can sometimes be hidden behind storm clouds, so too God's love, despite never ceasing, can sometimes feel hidden behind our emotional storms. That is when we must turn to reality as revealed in Scripture and know by faith, by our knowledge of God's reality and character, that God's love never fails and never ceases. Just as surely on the stormiest day, you know the sun is still shining. Don't you? Yeah. And on the stormiest emotional days, do you know God's love is still shining on you? And that's the difference between knowing by faith, which is an understanding of God's character and reality, and knowing by how I feel in the moment. When you're out on a stormy, rainy, cloudy day, and you don't feel the warmth of the sun bathing your skin, are you still confident the sun is shining? Yes. That's the difference. When we don't feel the love of God in the moment of the storm, do we still have confidence his love is shining? And we receive love just like we receive sunshine by placing ourselves in its rays. Think that through. That's how you receive sunshine. But we can choose to stay in the dark, to cover the windows with blinds, to never go outside during the day, to cut ourselves off from the sun, can't we? Likewise, despite God's love constantly flowing from heaven, we can choose to cut ourselves off from it, to stay in the darkness of bitterness. Resentment, hatred, bigotry, selfishness, fear, doubt, idolatry, legalistic religious enslavement, entertainment, and various forms of substance-induced stupors. All of this cuts us off, keeps us from experiencing the love that's flowing from heaven hides us from it. Yes? And when we cut ourselves off from sunlight, we necessarily and always will suffer physical and mental breakdown in time, in inevitability. Likewise, when we cut ourselves off from God's love and fill our hearts with fear, selfishness, the false numbing comforts of this world, we invariably suffer various physical and mental breakdowns completely predictable. Love of God shines everywhere, and when God's love is combined with, what's the other element that always needs to be combined with it to be powerful? Truth. 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 That's right. All, when, when the love is combined with truth that Jesus revealed, that's when it becomes powerful, restorative, recreative, in healing, when it's love is combined with truth, we realize how empty we are without him. How sick of heart and mind our natural selfish state is. How exhausting it is to constantly work to prove ourselves and get ahead. How much we need God's love. Thus, when by the truth and love of God we are won back to trust, we open our hearts to him, and our hearts are set right with him, reconciled to him. And that's called, in the theological terminology, 
Well, born again is a layman's term from the Bible, but the theological, that's correct. Justification. Justification. Putting right or setting right that which is wrong. And so when Abraham's natural heart distrusted God, the natural heart is enmity against God, distrusting. And when he was one to trust and he placed his trust in God, his natural untrusting heart had been set right in trust with God. Then God recognized, acknowledged, accounted, reckoned him to now be righteous. After his heart shifted from distrust to trust, put it right. And then once the heart is set right with God based on the truth and love, then God pours his love into our hearts. Romans 5, 5. We open the heart. He pours it in. And this love casts out fear. We no longer are driven by survival drives. Me first. What are they going to think of me? Oh, what do I need to do to get ahead? Do I need to lie, cheat, scam, whatever, exploit, because I have to protect myself? No, we're driven by love for God, love for God, and love for others. And thus we grow in righteousness. This is called a transforming experience, and the theological term for that is? Sanctification, Sanctification which is the fruit of justification. Nobody's sanctified if their heart isn't set right with God. But once the heart is set right with God and we trust him and we open the heart, then the indwelling spirit comes and we have new desires, new motives, new wisdom, new insight, new power when we choose. And that's, understand how it works. The Holy Spirit works on the heart with truth and love to bring you to conviction. And then you're left completely free to decide, yes, I will accept and follow the truth. No, I'm not ready yet because to follow that truth would have this consequence. I would have to end this relationship. I would have to change this job. I would have to give up this addiction. I would have to stop playing that game and I'd stop looking at this program. I'm not ready for that because I still like that. Okay, but I still love you. And so you're still going to have the truth and love weighing on you, but you have no power yet. When you come to the point when you say, finally, I'm ready to get real, you say, yes, Lord, I will choose to apply that to my life. I'm going to say no to this. Then you receive divine power because the power is never yours. The choice is yours. The power is God's. But we don't get the power until we make the choice. Paul puts it this way in Romans 5, 1 through 5. Since we have been made right with God by our faith, that's justification, made right, set right, put right. That's what it means to justify. When you justify the margins on your Word document, you're taking those lines that are, those, those sections that are out of line and you're setting them to the right. You're putting them right. That's justifying your margin. And our hearts, which are naturally self-centered and fearful, are put right when we trust God. So we have been made right by God. By, with God, by our faith. We have peace with God. This happens through our Lord Jesus Christ, who through our faith has brought us into the blessing of God's grace that we now enjoy. And we are happy because of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. We also have joy with our troubles, because we know that these troubles produce patience, and patience produces character, and character produces hope. And this hope will never disappoint us because God has poured his love to fill our hearts, poured out his love to fill our hearts. He gave us this love through the Holy Spirit whom God has given to us. Love and truth originate in God. And it is this reality, the goodness of God, that wins us back to trust, Romans 2, 4. Yes. The kindness of God leads us to repentance. When we trust God and give our consent, our consent, our permission, God, you have permission to come into my heart and mind and work. Why is that required? Because God has power. God is the infinite, powerful being. He has the power to come in without your permission, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. well, but, but if he did that, what would be the problem? Why does he wait for you? I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, that's the door to your heart and mind, he comes in. But he doesn't come in until you open the door. Why? He has the power to, to knock the door down, right? He doesn't want to force. He, do, he doesn't want to force, but there's a reason why. Pardon? Freedom. Law of liberty, that's right. Freedom, that's right. Why? And what's the consequence? There you go. Because he loves you. He loves your individuality. He loves your personhood. He loves you for who you are. And the only way he can save you 
is when you agree and make the choice to be saved. To go against your will and override you, he turns you into a zombie, a robot, somebody who's not you anymore. The only way he can save you is when he wins you with the truth and wins you with the love where you go, yes, I agree. I want that too. Then you receive it and you're changed and you're still you. That's the only way. Yes. Um, so if you've got something in your life that you actually like doing and you know it's not best for you, so we can ask God to come into our heart and ask him to change our mind? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. And your desires particularly. If you already know it's not your mind that needs to be changed, it's your affections, your heart attitude, your, what you desire, or the feelings that you get, the, 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 the longings that you have. These are the, the deeper wellsprings. Yeah. It's not just, if you already know, you don't need, it's like most smokers actually don't need facts <laughs> and truths about the damage of smoking. Right. They know. Yeah. So it's not, I need the truth Oh, I had no idea. I thought I was actually going to live 20 years longer if I smoked two packs a day. Okay? That is not where most smokers are coming from. Okay? What they're coming from is they're coming from the position of, I know it's bad, but I like it and long for it anyway. So it's not truth they need. They need a new heart's desire. And this is what Paul is saying here, that that there's this process of troubles and tribulations and, and struggles that produce patience, that produce character. We go through a process, and this is where he's pouring his love. Paul's connecting this struggle with the love of God being poured into our hearts. So he loves us so much, he allows us to have these struggles. Well, he said to Paul, it's painful to kick against the thorns. Remember this statement? It's painful. Mm -hmm. If you kick against the thorns, literally thorn bushes, you kick bare feet against thorn bushes, what are you going to experience? And is that pain a curse, a punishment, a bad thing, or is that pain a blessing to you? It's a good thing. It tells you again. It's a blessing to you. Why is it a blessing to you? Wake because your action is objectively injurious and harmful, and the pain alerts you to what you're doing is harmful, so you'll stop doing it. Like touching a hot stove. If you feel pain when you touch that, you pull your hand back very quickly and min minimize the damage. If you have leprosy, and this is in the Bible, leprosy is a metaphor for sin. What leprosy does, leprosy does not actually damage tissue. Leprosy destroys pain fibers. So when a person touches the hot stove, they don't feel any pain. It doesn't hurt them. So when do they realize they're touching the hot stove? When they smell burning flesh. That's a lot more damage happening before they pull back. And that's what sin does to our consciences. It causes us to become insensitive to the movements of the Holy Spirit, and we can participate in things that are harmful until the negative external consequences and the smoke and destruction of what we're doing become so intense. Our kids don't want to talk to us. Our wife is leaving us. We've been arrested. We've been put in jail. All the negative consequences are happening, and the smoke is filling up, and finally we go, oh, maybe this isn't working. <laughs> So, it's, so this idea of trials and tribulations that come are often to alert us that there are elements in our life that need to be adjusted and changed and worked on. And it might not be there's an overt sin we're, we're actually engaged in, that what we need to work on simply might be self-sufficiency and not trusting God with the future. And many people that I see in my practice, they're struggling with years of anxiety and depression, and if you get down to it, they're not doing anything overtly evil, they're not breaking into the Ten Commandments per se, but they live their life with constantly worrying about future events, what other people think, and they're constantly worrying that something might go wrong, and they don't focus on simply fulfilling their duties in governance of themselves. This is my duty to do, and I will fulfill it to the best of my ability, and then trust God with how it turns out. They're constantly calculating the future and all the angles to try to figure out to make sure life goes the way they think it should go. It's stressful. It's exhausting. It's tiring. It's fear-driven. Even, even if what you're doing is based on, but I want to do the right thing. I don't want to make a mistake. I, 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 I don't want to sin. But that's not from faith. And Paul says whatever is not from faith is sin. And then you live your life like a Pharisee. Like Paul describes his life prior to the Damascus Road, right? 
And what was his life prior to the Damascus Road? His life was a constant life of frustration and difficulty and, and exhaustion and works to try to be a righteous man, but he had no peace. Then, so back to the text, we're going to unpack that text of John 15. Love originates in God. We simply receive it and participate in it. We say yes to it. We align with it. We apply it. We receive power to fulfill it. We're transformed by it. And the next, after we receive it, we are to remain. Jesus said, as the Father loved me, so I love you. Remain in my love. Remain in God's love. We don't earn it. God, we don't earn God's love. We don't fight for it. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to work, compete, or in any other fashion struggle to receive God's love. God's love is, a, is not conditional. But we have to abide in it to benefit from it. To rest in his presence, to rest in his love, his goodness, his grace. We're to remain and live in God's love every single day, but we are especially to rest in his love on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a special gift built into time for beings. Now, get this, get this play, word play, but it has a meaning. I'm saying it on purpose. It's for us to exercise our rest. We are to exercise our rest. That's what the Sabbath is for, for you to choose to exercise your rest. What does that mean to exercise rest? To choose to stop all our working. Whether working for our own advancement here on earth through our business or schoolwork, or working to earn someone's love or approval by our housework or our six pack abs, <laughs> <laughs> or working to save ourselves through our various religious rituals and law keeping and Sabbath observances. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is a gift to us made for humans, humans were not made for the Sabbath. That's right. Gymnasiums were made for humans. Humans were not made for gymnasiums. <laughs> Seriously, same with the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for us. We are not made to be enslaved by it. And just like a gymnasium, you go, you don't go. The owner of the gymnasium does not hunt you down and punish you for not going to the gym. <laughs> But you don't get any of the benefits that come from regular gymnastic activities. The Sabbath is a gift for you to exercise your rest. To exercise what it means to actually rest from all your work. And I don't mean work to earn a living. I mean work to prove yourself. Work to prove you're worthy to be loved. And most people I know are working to prove that they're lovable. Love me. Love me. The Sabbath is God's gift to say, guys, it's your gift. Just rest and know I love you for who you are. I've always loved you. I loved you so much I gave my life for you. When will you stop trying to prove yourself to earn my love? You don't have to. You need to remain in my love. But the Sabbath is only a blessing in this regard to strengthen your confidence, your faith, your experience, your love, if it's a delight, Isaiah 58. If it's a rule that we must keep in fear of doing something wrong and then we're in trouble with the ruling authority, we're not resting, we're working. And so many Adventists I know, the Sabbath is the biggest work day of the week while they avoid all the work they're not supposed to do. <laughs> Am I right or wrong, guys? But remaining in God's love means we are to, Jesus said, obey his commands. But can you command people to love you and actually get love? No. Can you get more love from your spouse or children by commanding love with authority and threats of punishment? Love me. And if you don't love me, I'm required by holiness to burn you. <laughs> now, I can only burn you for a few minutes till your body dies. God loves you enough to burn you as long as you deserve. Might be weeks and days or some version's eternity, that's how much he loves you. Can you get love by commanding with threats? No. no. So what does this mean? Jesus said, I give you a new command to love what either. If you love me, you obey my commands. 
What's going on with that? It all goes back to what's the core question we ask in this class all the time? What law lens lens are you looking through? If you understand the word command through human idea of law and justice, then it's an edict, it's a ruling, it's a directive, it's a requirement, it's an external imposition. Do it or else. That's how human governments work. You are commanded not to drive more than 35 in college. And trust me, they will enforce that command. <laughs> Anybody had that command enforced in college, Dale? <laughs> but if you worship a God who has given you the command and enforces it through punishment, you're actually not worshiping the creator. You're worshiping a creature. The creator builds reality. And the laws that the creator builds reality upon are the protocols that life exists and operates upon, the physical laws of health, the laws that govern the planetary bodies, the moral laws that govern our our, operations of our mind, hearts, and relationships. These are all constants upon which reality operates. That's what the creator builds. Creatures, we can't build reality. We can't change those types of law. We make up rules that require enforcement. If you worship a God who simply makes up rules and uses power to punish rule breaker, you're worshiping a creature. You are not worshiping the creator. No matter what label you give that creature, you may call him Yahweh, you may call him Yeshua, you may call him Jesus. That is not the creator. The creator doesn't work that way. When we return to worshiping the creator, though, we understand his laws or the laws, and you might simply say the laws of health, the laws upon which life and health function and operate, the protocols of reality. And we realize that life is only possible in harmony with God and his design laws for life. Then we understand what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you want to be healthy and thrive, then live in harmony with the laws of health. Obey the laws of health if you want to be healthy. If you want to remain in my love, then don't break the law of love. That's what he's saying. If you want to remain in my love, don't break it. If you want to remain healthy, don't break the laws of health. It's that simple. This is what he's saying. The command is, live in harmony with how life operates. Sin breaks God's design law for life. It is driven by fear, and fear turns the mind towards self, and self turns the mind towards survival of the fittest, me first, kill or be killed, ultimately. God's perfect love casts out fear. And when we experience remaining God's love, his love frees us from being controlled, not tempted, but controlled by fear. And instead of seeking to protect self at the expense of others, we sacrifice ourselves and benefit others just as Jesus has done and taught us. Greater love is no man, that he give his life for a friend, as we read. This selfless love is not, the selfless love is not of this world. It is not found in Satan. It is not found in any of the kingdoms of this world. All of the kingdoms of the world are beastly. All of them use force. All of them use coercion. All of them use infliction of punishment. All of them use deceit. All of them will go to war and kill others to advance their agenda. All of them. Because all the kingdoms of the world belong to Satan's kingdom, and they operate on a different system of rules and principles. This eternal healing... Life-giving love comes only from God and flows to us through Jesus via his representative on earth, the Holy Spirit. And whenever and wherever you see such self-sacrificial love operating, when you see acts of selfless love occurring, that is evidence of the Holy Spirit applying the character and love of Christ into a person's heart, whether that person acknowledges Jesus or not. It's still the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing the love of God that they do not possess in themselves to bear, and they're identifying with it. They like it better, and they're choosing to be on God's side, even though they may not have even heard of him yet. Since, understand this very clearly, no human being other than Jesus, since Adam sinned, possesses self-sacrificial love for others as a natural expression of their heart. Did you all hear that? Repeat that. Since Adam sinned, no human being possesses self-sacrificial love for others as a natural expression of their heart. 
It is a supernatural recreation from God working in their heart. Amen. Then, in our John 15 text, Jesus does the most incredible, unbelievable, truly preposterous thing from the worldly standpoint. He refuses to accept us in the role of servants to him, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of all reality, and instead tells us that his desire, his intent, his wishes, his will, is that we are his friends. Get your mind around that, folks. The King of kings, Lord of lords, creator, sustainer of all things, doesn't want you as his servant. He wants you as his friend. What does it mean, then, to be a friend of God? To be his friend. We know he's our friend. I mean, we've sang that song, what a friend we have in Jesus, haven't we? We know he's our friend. Do you know that you're his friend? Have you considered yourself a friend of God's? Jesus is a friend of mine. I'd like to introduce you. Jesus is a friend of mine. What is the difference between being a servant and a friend? Graham Maxwell used to ask or stay, either way, it's rhetorical. Is there a difference between friendly service and a serving friend? Is there a difference between friendly service and a serving friend? Yeah. So being a friend of God does not mean that we do not serve. What it means is we give the only type of service that matters, the service that comes from an understanding, love, and appreciation which a friend has, not the service that comes from fear of punishment for breaking a rule which the servant has. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Do you think that's why God... Job called him his servant. Job, have you seen a more righteous man on the earth? No, I don't. No, the servant, the, the servant language in Scripture has another meaning. And the servant language in Scripture, if you look in Revelation chapter 7, about the 144,000 being sealed, hold, hold, hold until my servants are sealed in their forehead. And the servants through Scripture are my servants, the prophets. They're the spokespersons for God. They're actually the ones who say the truth about God. That's the, the, the designation. If you want to be a servant of God, you actually have to be his friend because you actually have to be able to say what is right of God as Job did. And so Job in, in this context is called the servant because at the end of the book of Job, he says of God what is right. He speaks rightly, which makes him a friend of God. So, But many people who, who read the Bible superficially and see the language servant don't do the deep study to see, what, well, who is the servant? They're the prophets, which are the spokespersons. They're the ones who are serving God. And you can't actually say what is right of God if you don't know him. Life eternal. They might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ is now sent. So you have to actually come into an intimacy. Knowing God is not knowing about God. And many people go to college to get a degree to study the biography of Jesus Christ and, and God. The biography is like getting a degree on studying the life of Lincoln. And you can get a degree in studying the life of Lincoln. And I will say to you, do you know Abraham Lincoln? No, but I know all about him. I got a, I got a PhD degree. Okay? And many people graduate from theological seminaries with these doctoral degrees and, and, and about the Bible and about God. They still don't know God, but they claim that, that they're experts and people surrender their thinking and decision making. Life eternal is not knowing about God, it's knowing God. And so the true spokesmen for God are the ones that know him, are friends of him, and then can say the right thing about him. And when you know God, let me tell you something, when you actually know him, this is what you'll know. He will never use his power to harm you. Amen. And when somebody comes to you and said, well, God is love, but he's also just. And if you break his rule, then law requires him in justice to punish you. But he loved you so much that he punished Jesus in your set. And you're set. If you don't get his, if the payment of Jesus at your behalf, then he'll be required to punish you too. Anybody who's saying that is not a friend of God. Because they're lying about him. They're misrepresenting him. They don't know him. If they knew him, they would say, think about your spouse. If you have a spouse that, is lo that loves you and is trustworthy, Everybody doesn't have that. But if you have a spouse that loves you and is trustworthy, and somebody came to you and said, hey, 
your spouse has been cheating on you and molesting kids. No, not, not true. I know, my, it's not true. You can reject that. When you know God, then these lies about him you can reject. And the evidence is there as well in Scripture to show that. And this is what it means to be a friend of God. A friend of God says the truth about him and won't get duped into these systems of theology that have a deity that functions like a creature and not like the creator. The friends of God don't buy into that because they know him. This is not God. That's a, that, that's a false representation. That's a lie. It's a caricature. So Joseph was not... He, was, he wasn't just um, a servant of God. He was God's friend. Yep. So did that make him um, to Potiphar more than just a servant to Potiphar? Because no. He was a servant. Not to was, Potiphar. Potiphar, he was Potiphar's. He was a servant. In Potiphar's mind, he was a slave. Yeah. But Potiphar came to recognize such integrity in, in Joseph. He invested Potiphar with authority that slaves don't get. He trusted him. And you don't trust your slave. But he trusted Joseph. He trusted Joseph more than he trusted his wife. Because if he had believed his wife, Joseph would have been executed. He didn't believe his wife. He believed Joseph. But he had to stay face for his position in the court and the politics of the time, so he had to send Joseph to prison. I imagine there was a rift in that marriage after that. <laughs> There was one before. Well, well, yeah, but there was certainly there was one before, but that rift grew. I mean, yeah. Joseph for Potiphar was the goose that laid the golden egg. I mean, everything he did blessed him. His wealth, his power, his position, everything blessed with Joseph running the helm. You have to take him out now to save face. I think that would have been interesting to hear you counsel them. <laughs> <laughs> So this is what, it, to be a friend of Jesus means we actually know him. And Jesus prophesied at the end of time, in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, Lord, that they will come to him and they will say, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them, that's Jesus, will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. These people are going around the world doing much Christian mission. We're doing missions these are missionaries doing Christian mission in the name of Jesus. Jesus said he never knew them. They weren't friends. Why? Because they were converting. Remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, now you go search the word over to find a convert. When you do, you make him twice the son of hell as you are. You're converting him, but you're not converting him to the kingdom of God. Why? Because you're ver converting him to a legalistic, authoritarian deity who runs no, his universe no different than a creature. You're converting him to creature worship, not creator worship. And this is what much of Christianity is doing. It's teaching people that God runs his kingdom like a Caesar runs Rome. He makes up rule, uses his power to punish rule breakers, and people end up worshiping a being they call Jesus, and then they go out and represent him as the source of inflicted pain and torment and torture and create a legalistic system with one member of the Godhead in heaven pleading his blood to the other member of the Godhead so he doesn't hurt us. <laughs> They're not friends. Jesus said, we don't know each other. If you knew me, you would never say that about me. I think we need to realize that God needs to be known just like we like to be known. I compare it to like the difference between reading a recipe and eating the cake. <laughs> you know, we, we read the recipe and all it sounds good and stuff, but until you eat the cake, you don't really know what that's going to taste like. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So being a friend of God's, we love him. We know him. And Jesus explicitly said, we understand the master's business. Yes. The friend understands the master's business, yes. That's the only way Abraham could have had the faith he had in God to know him. Servants don't understand the master's business. Service, servants focus on the rules, on the commands, on the instructions. The master said it, I believe it, that's all there is to it. <laughs> I'll be punished if I don't do it. And I'll be punished if I don't. And you will be too. 
<laughs> but friends go beyond rule keeping, beyond simply doing what they're told. They enter into understanding relationship, empathy, and appreciation with and for the master. A friend of God shares in the master's desires, values, methods, principles. They align themselves with his heart and they are jealous for his reputation, his goals, his kingdom. They love what he loves and hates what he hates. And then as friends of God who are one to love and trust, who understand his methods, principles, design laws, his business of saving souls. That's what he's in the business of doing, folks. He's in the business of eradicating sin from hearts and minds of sinners and saving souls. When we understand his business, we choose to work in God's field, in God's garden, seeking to tend to hurting souls and bring them back Amen. into saving relation with Jesus Christ. So Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20, from the Good News Translation. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins. Notice that, folks. That's scripture, not me. God did not keep. There's no record book. He's monitoring. Check, 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 check. God did not keep an account of their sins. And he has given us the message that tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Amen. Love one another as I have loved you is the command. This is what it means. Sunday's lesson focused on the gift of hospitality. Boy, I'm going to have to really move. We just finished Sabbath's lesson. Woo! Ah. <laughs> Uh, I might skip that. We're going to just skip that, and we're going to move on to Monday's lesson. Love for everyone. What does this mean in action? Does loving everyone mean giving everyone what they need? Excuse me, what they want? No. Does it mean giving them what they need if they actually have a need? <coughs> Somebody said yes. What if they have a real need but they have the ability to procure and fulfill that need on their own. But it's a real need. Do, is it love to, to fulfill that need for them if their own choices are causing them to avoid fulfilling the need for themselves? If it's a physical need, I would agree that everyone has a spiritual need that they cannot supply. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you supply anyone's spiritual need? No. So we're not asking about the Holy Spirit's providing a spiritual need. We're asking about what we do to others. Can we provide someone's spiritual need? Thank you. <laughs> no, but you're right. We all have spiritual needs that we cannot supply on our own. It has to come from God. That's, uh, thank you for pointing that out. It's very helpful. Because, because, because some people can... Get, but we're talking about our role in relating to people. How do we love other people? Do we love other people when they have a real need that we could supply, but they also could supply, but they're not doing it? Paul, this is where we go back to what we read in Romans 5 earlier about our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint. God has poured his love into our hearts. Paul is connecting this suffering process with God's pouring his love in our hearts. There's a process of this. Is suffering required for character building? <laughs> One of my friends said, long ago said, pain is fertilizer for the soul. I will tell you it's absolutely true. I've done the greatest growth in my relation with God during the most painful times of my life. Is anyone else... Isn't that true for all of us? We had a picket fence yeah. life that we all dream of. When would we ever really get down on our knees and soul search mm -hmm. and be open to correction and so on? So think this through about loving others, suffering, victory. Did Jacob experience any trials and sufferings in his life? 
were those trials and sufferings important for Jacob's ultimate victory in being re renamed Israel? Yes. Were they part of the process that he needed? Yes. Would we then have acted in love and be a blessing and help Jacob if we would have done something to relieve the night of his trouble so he didn't suffer so much that night? Would we have been a blessing to him to do that? No. Given a little Xanax, a little Valium, put him to bed. I know you're really anxious tonight, really stressed. Here, take this, go to bed tonight, have a good night's sleep. Would we have helped him that night? No. How about if, no, God, couldn't God have inspired Esau to send a servant ahead with a message of forgiveness and reassurance before that night? Couldn't have done that? And if Jacob would have gotten that message from Esau, all is forgiven, having a party here when you get here, would that message have actually been a blessing to Jacob or would it have prevented him from the night he needed? It would have relieved a night of struggle and suffering, but it would have obstructed Jacob from actually dying to self, which is what he needed to do. I know the night of my daughter's conversion, I know that um, I was at home and she had called me and it was the hardest thing I had to do because God impressed on my heart, don't you dare go over there. Good for he you. He told me in my yep. heart, Good. he said, That's I'm right. trying to do That's right. work in her. That's right. And so three o'clock in the morning after this process, I drifted to sleep. And when I woke up, I looked up and said, can I go now? And it's like I had peace about it, and I went. So this is the 23rd Psalm, folks. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside the still waters. In our life, the Lord will always start in our life by providing us the resources, the water and the, and the green pastures and the, and the food and the, whatever we need to give, get us strong enough for the journey. He will always get us strong enough for the journey. I shall not want. And he, lead, he, he will, and for the purpose, it tells you, well, he's doing this to restore our soul. He will restore my soul. And then he leads us, as, we, as our souls are being restored, he leads us down the path of righteousness for his name, his character's sake, for his glory's purposes. And when we start to walk with him down the path of righteousness for the restoration of our soul, he leads us directly into, he leads us into the valley of the shadow of death. <clears throat> Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This is not the valley of death. Get, just throw that completely out of your mind. It is the valley of the shadow of death. This is the valley when you feel like you're dying on the inside. This is the valley that Jacob was in in the night he wrestled with the angel. This is the valley that David went in when he was confronted by Nathan and had to confront his own wickedness. This is the valley that Peter went in the night that he betrayed his Lord and went out and wept bitterly. This is the valley that everyone must go into when Paul says, I die I'm crucified with Christ. This is where self dies. And when we're in that valley, yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. He's taking you in the valley. He's got you by his hand. He's going to go to this valley for the purpose of freeing you from the control of fear and selfishness. His rod and staff, they come for you. Shepherd's rod was used to beat the wolves. So he's all the enemies who want to destroy you while you're down, while you're low, while you're, while you're hopeless, while you're depressed, while you're anxious, all the enemies that want to, want to get rid of he's going to beat them back. And, and, the, and the staff has the crook on it. When you fall into the ditch, the shepherd puts the crook under the sheep and puts them back on the path. And so when you fall in the ditch and you're helpless and hopeless, he picks you up and puts you back on the path. This is what the story is telling us. What was the first part of the <laughs> he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. This is the table of the Lord's table. This is the, 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 the unleavened bread. This is my body that is broken for you. The word that was made flesh, the word of truth that we ingest and the truth sets us free. And we partake of the, the, un, the, the unfermented wine, which is the new life that we receive in Christ. And he anoints our head with oil, which is the Holy Spirit that recreates, cleanses, and renews us. And then we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the Psalms 23. This is the trial, the agony, the suffering, the dying to the old way. Now, your question. The first, the first part you said about he prepares us yes. to, to walk through. Yes. And the, how does it say to do that? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside the still waters. He starts us at a place 
But let me tell you where, where we have the strength then to walk with him. This is the first coming to him where we have that epiphany joy experience with Jesus. Oh, yes, I love him. But then he leads us in this place we have to confront. Okay? Wow. And this is, what, this is what happens to many people. They will have the conversion experience. They will have the joy of knowing Jesus loves them and God loves them. And then God begins to lead them into that place where they have to face the darkness in their own soul. And it becomes very unpleasant because it feels like they're dying inside. I went through this. And that's when they run back to their comfort, their alcohol, their drugs, their games, their pornography, whatever it might be. And they cycle back there for a while and fall. And then they find the consequences coming and it's not working. And they go back to the shepherd and he loves them, forgives them. They experience grace, the still waters, still waters of their soul, the green pastures, and then he starts to lead them in the valley again. And he will keep leading them in the valley until they're willing to die to the old way, Linda. Mm -hmm. I, know I, I never forget the time when I first read those. They're just six verses. They tell the entire story of redemption in just six verses. It starts off with, he, he's wonderful, isn't God wonderful? It isn't until the valley of the shadow of death that he becomes you. He moves from a third person in the, in the verse, he restores my soul, isn't he great? After the shadow of death, you, you anoint my head with oil, you do this. They, that has brought you into a closer relationship with God, even in the verbiage of the six verses. Thank you. In the lesson, it's asked, pointing how Abraham demonstrated love for other people when he... Um, when God came to announce the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and he asked for 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 righteous people, don't destroy the city. It points out that Abraham had concern for the sin sick, the wicked, the perishing, and he asked God not to destroy the city if there were 10 righteous. We see the heart and compassion and love of Abraham demonstrated in this conversation. But we see that God destroyed the city anyway. Does that mean God had less love and compassion than Abraham? If God has more love and compassion than Abraham, why did he destroy the city? Because he loved Abraham. Genesis 3.15. As soon as Adam sinned, all humans, every human being, Adam, Eve, and all their descendants, now infected with a terminal sin condition, and we're all going to die, except God said, the seed of the woman is coming to crush the serpent's head, and the serpent will bruise his heel. Without Messiah, no human being could be saved after Adam's sin. The whole Old Testament narrative is the story of the coming Messiah. The whole Old Testament. This is why it keeps focusing on where it focuses. At the flood, we're focusing on the entire world. The whole world is wicked. Shortly after the flood, we actually focus on Abraham because God renews the promise given in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head through your seed. Now we know that the seed, that promise, is not coming through any family in the whole planet. It's coming through Abraham's family. And then it's repeated to Isaac. And so we focus on Isaac's kids because we're not focusing on Ishmael's kids, Abraham's kids through Ishmael. We're focused, and the promise is repeated to Isaac. It's coming through your kids, Isaac, but not through Esau. It's repeated to Jacob. It's coming through Jacob's kids. And we're following down now, and we're narrowing the focus of human history. And we're following the branch of the human family through whom, whom this Messiah will come. And then through the quarters of time, we actually lose 10 of the tribes, and we end up focusing only on Judah, because that's who, where the Messiah is coming. The whole story of the Old Testament is fulfilling Genesis 3.15. And God, looking down the quarters of time, sees that even without Sodom and Gomorrah, there was five cities destroyed. Without these five cities, only two of the tribes made it through to Jesus. Ten of them got assimilated by the pagans around them. Wow. And so God excises the necrotic tissue, yes. the minimum excision that he could do to maintain the avenue so Satan can't use those pagan nations to destroy the avenue for Messiah and no humans be saved. This was not an act of punishment for sin. This was a therapeutic action just as a doctor might do to amputate a leg and you have to remember all those deaths were first death they just went to sleep they're coming up in a resurrection that's what daniel went daniel went to sleep he's coming up in a resurrection there'll be different resurrections but these people are not the, the wages of sin death and even people hold that penal legal lie and they say well, no god's punishing sin you go wait when does punishment happen before or after judgment 
Judgment first, punishment second. Well, the judgment was future from this time. So what's happening here is not punishment for sin, even in their own model. Notice what else this story tells us. God first discussed with Abraham his plan to destroy the cities. Foreknowing, he foreknew Abraham's response. He knew Abraham was going to argue 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. And God already knew that there weren't that many in there. But God had this conversation for the purpose of Abraham having the conversation, for the purpose of recording in Scripture so that every one of you and I may know that there was no savable people in that city. They had persisted in sin so long, they destroyed within them the faculties that respond to the Holy Spirit. There was no amount of truth and no amount of love that could win them back to trust. They had burned out those abilities, and they were completely eternally lost at that point. And that is why God acted to excise them so they could not be used to prevent the righteous from coming to salvation. Amen. And for the Messiah coming. So, we had some other interesting... Should I go over today, folks? I have some really interesting stuff. Sure. Okay, so we're going to go along today. You could say, as Abraham's having this conversation with God about Sodom, could you say that this was a form of prayer? He's conversing with... Have you heard prayers, conversation with God is with a friend? Yeah. So he's actually praying and, the, and interceding in a way... But what do you, and he's asking that God save or not destroy these people of Sodom. That's what he's asking for, isn't it? But what do you then make of 1 John 5, 16 and 17? If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those, sin, who, those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that does not lead to death. That's not me, that's John. If you see somebody in sin that leads to death, don't pray about it. What do you know? <laughs> Have you ever read this text and gone, hmm, that's a head scratcher right there, man. <laughs> that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I'm going to just cut to the chase because something else I want to, want to share with you, but I'll read to you how I paraphrase this in the remedy. <laughs> if you see a fellow Christian who desires to be Christ-like commit an act of sin, you should talk with God about them God knows, knowing that God will completely heal them and give them life if they open their heart and trust to God. Such sin does not result in eternal death as it is merely residual symptoms of a heart in the process of being healed. However, there is no use in asking God to heal and give eternal life to the sinners who close their heart to God and stubbornly refuse to allow him to heal them. Love cannot be forced, and God cannot force people to love and trust him. So there is no use in praying for God to force people to accept him. All violations of love are sin, but violations of love which occur in someone who opens their heart to God do not lead to eternal death. Wow, that makes sense. Pretty straightforward when you understand design law. You understand behavior. It's all about the deed, and it's really confusing. And then in Tuesday's lesson, we're going to finish on Tuesday's lesson today, and I'm going to go over since it's already 11. But I think this will be very helpful because I get questions about what we're going to talk about all the time. In fact, a question came in again this week about this subject. It's a in the first paragraph, it says, The dialogue between Abraham and God is a type, a representation of intercessory prayer. Abraham is presented in this chapter as an intercessor before God for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was pleading for them in behalf of them. That is, he was in a way acting as a type, a symbol of Jesus as our intercessor before the Father. Our mission today will be successful only if we proceed with these kinds of prayer. Whoever wrote this, they don't know God. God, this is not how heaven functions. There's not a division amongst the Godhead with one pleading amongst the other. This is a misrepresentation of God's character. They're making him look out to be a being who has to be pled with to show mercy. Without me going into what I'm going to go into, I just off the top of your head, you should be dropping in your Bible verses. For God so hated the world that his son had to plead with him to give mercy. 
wait, that's not what my Bible says. God was so wrathful at the world. He was so virtuous and righteous and offended by our sin that his son had to beg him off. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If God is not for us, but Christ is for us, wait, that's not what it says. It says it in Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare us, some, but gave him up. How will we not along with him give us all things? Who is at the condemns? Christ Jesus. He is at the Father's hand and is also interceding for us. What's the word also mean? In addition to. Jesus is also in addition to, in addition to who? Who's the other one in the text? The Father. The Father's interceding for us. Too. And the Holy Spirit, earlier in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit intercedes with groans and utterances. So in Romans 8, we have all three members of the Godhead interceding for us. Wow. And where do they intercede? Let me tell you, they intercede in three places. The Godhead, united, as one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. And what did Jesus say in John 16, 26? I will not pray the Father for you because the Father loves you himself. So Jesus said he's not going to do what our quarterly says he's up there doing. <laughs> But how do they intercede? In three places. Right in Genesis, as soon as they sin, the promise in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, the children of God, the church. We do not have a natural revulsion to sin. When you have something that morally pulls you to God, a longing for righteousness, when you're put off by evil, that is the Holy Spirit interceding in your heart to put a desire for righteousness, for, for God in your heart that does not naturally exist from the sin state. Yeah. He's interceding in our hearts with the Holy Spirit to convict us and to draw us and to woo us. He also intercedes with the principalities and powers of darkness. He will not let any temptation take you that is com not common to man. He will not allow you to be taken more than you are able, but show a way of escape. We see the hedge of protection that he puts around. Remember, Elisha and the angel army is about. He is constantly interceding with the powers of darkness to hold at bay what the darkness would like to do to the righteous. And he intercedes in a third place. Through Jesus Christ, he who knew no sin became sin for us. And he interceded with the natural consequence of what sin does to the human being, and it results in death. And Jesus Christ partook. He became, took upon himself human flesh that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death that is the devil. And because of Adam, we were all on one path towards eternal death. Because Jesus partook of our humanity and overcame, he interceded in that trajectory, in that course, in that destiny, if you will, and he opened a new path for all who have faith in him can have the path of eternal life. Amen. This is his intercession. And the Father, Son, and Spirit are united in their intercessions for the salvation of man. And Satan wants to pervert this with a human legal system where one member of the Godhead is interceding with another. But now, for those of you who value the writings of Ellen White, and many uh, of you have family and friends who have an Adventist background, you might get hit with the following quote. And this is what we're going to close on, and it's going to go for a few more minutes, but I want you to be prepared to answer this when, when somebody throws this at you, maybe a theology professor, maybe a, a legalistic, good-hearted, but very deluded family member who doesn't understand reality and doesn't understand God, has his legal, and look at this language in the context of intercession and pleading and what Jesus is doing in heaven. This is 5 Testimony 470. Man cannot meet these charges himself. In his sinless, excuse me, in his sin-stained garments, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who, by repentance and faith, have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes the accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. His perfect obedience to God's law, even unto death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and earth, and he claims of his Father mercy and reconciliation for guilty man. But while we should realize our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments found not upon our merits, but upon his own. And this will be thrown out. See, he's up there pleading. So let's tell you what it means. Let me cut a couple principles when you hear this kind of stuff. First, you should say, what law lens am I reading it through? Am I reading that through human law, human legal justice system, processing it through some type of courtroom process, 
If you are, you're on Satan's landscape. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Satan is the one who, in the opening of the great controversy, declared the law of God cannot be obeyed. Uh, obeyed. Every sin must meet its punishment, urge Satan. Satan is the legalist. Satan is the rule giver. Satan is a creature. He makes up rules that requires enforcement. God is the creator. So whenever you go onto the landscape of a legal system, you're on Satan's landscape, not God's. Understand that very clearly. So if that's how you're thinking, you've already lost because you're, you're kind of in the matrix. You gotta come back and worship the creator. And that's the message that the end of time that God calls the people to give. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. We're called to creator worship and he builds around his laws or design protocols. And when you come out of that, then you will see that this can't mean that. It has to mean something else. You also will remember and drop in those other texts if this is true, if this statement that I read is actually uh, going to harmonize, it will always harmonize with Scripture, not contradict it. And Jesus said he's not going to plead the Father on our behalf. So this can't mean he's up there pleading to the Father some legal payment system. It can't mean that. Or it's a contradicts what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. So then you, I would recommend, after you think through the methods of God, the design of God, get yourself in the design law landscape, remember what Jesus said about what he would do, understand it can't mean this, but you're still, I still don't know how to explain it though. I, I, I won't accept it means that, but I still don't know how to explain it. Go back to the author that originated these words and read in larger context. Read the paragraph before, read the paragraph after. See what the landscape that the author set for this paragraph. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna read three paragraphs. But you can also read wider in the author's writings to see what the author meant. But we're just going to do three paragraphs. Let's start one paragraph and see what happens here. As Satan accused Joshua and his people, so in all ages he accuses those who are seeking mercy in favor of God. In the Revelation, he is declared to be the accuser of the brethren, which accuses them before our God day and night. The controversy is repeated over every soul that is rescued from the power of evil and whose name is registered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Never is one received from the family of Satan into the family of God without exciting a determined resistance of the wicked one. Satan's accusations against those who seek the Lord are not prompted by displeasure of their sins. He exalts in their defective character. Only through their transgression of God's law can he obtain power over them. His accusations arise solely from his enmity to Christ. Through the plan of salvation, Jesus is breaking Satan's hold upon the human family and rescuing souls from his power. All the hatred and malignity of the arch rebel is stirred as he beholds the evidence of Christ's supremacy. And with fiendish power and cunning, he works to wrest from him the remnant. Notice he works, he's working to wrest from Christ, the remnant of the children of men who have accepted his salvation. So with his first paragraph, notice where the battle's happening. Satan is the accuser, Christ is our redeemer, and Satan is arguing to wrest souls from the security they found in Christ. Satan's power, the power of lies, selfishness, inciting of fear. Who is it you think that actually gives any time and credit and traction to the lies of Satan. Do you think when Satan tells lies in heaven, the father's going, hmm, maybe he's got something going on there. <laughs> or, do you th I mean, or do you think the father goes, you're a liar. <laughs> do you think Satan has any power on the father? No. no. So where do Satan's words have power? Okay, get your mind. That's exactly where it has power. That's where the battle is being fought. Continue on. He, Satan, leads men into skepticism, causing them to lose confidence in God and separate from his love. So notice the battle. He's making accusation to lead saved souls to doubt, to have skepticism, and to separate themselves from God's love. Who's listening? Not the Father, not Jesus, you and me. Continue on with the quote. He tempts them to break God's law, and then he claims them as his captives and contests the right of Christ to take them from him. He knows that those who seek God earnestly for pardon and grace will obtain it. Therefore, he presents their sins before them to discourage them. This is the process. Notice the dynamic here. The author doesn't say that Satan knows he can find a sin the person committed that they forgot to confess and ask forgiveness for. The remains on the legal registries in heaven, and while God would like to be able to not punish them, since they didn't ask for it, it hasn't had the blood of Christ applied, and therefore God's required legally to still kill them. This is not what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Satan knows who, that everyone who trusts God, as Isaiah 55 says, will receive free pardon 
from God and grace that heals and restores them and gives them a new heart and empowers them to live victoriously. So Satan accuses the sinner to the sinner to discourage the sinner and tempt them to give up. I'm no good. My sins are too much. I've gone beyond. I'm condemned. Why try? Continuing on with the quote. He, Satan, is constantly seeking occasion against those who are trying to obey God. Even their best and most acceptable service he seeks to make appear corrupt. To whom? To the repentant sinner in order to discourage them so that they give up. So to whom then do you think Christ would need to plead with? Do you think he needs to plead with his father, my blood, my blood, father, I've been sinless, I've been holy, my blood. Uh, I, I love them, you know I really love them. You love them, don't you, father? Yes, yes, you love them, I know you do. Is this the conversation? No, no. Or is the conversation, who is the people, where is the doubt, where is the fear, where is the insecurity? Who needs the reassurance? Who needs the confidence? Who needs to be pled with? So notice... By countless devices, the most subtle and most cruel, Satan endeavors to secure their condemnation. Their condemnation from whom? Continuing on, man cannot meet these charges himself in his sin-stained garment, confessing his guilt, he stands before God. Notice this is the quote that I read a moment ago. We're picking it up now. We're jumping in to where that quote was a moment ago, but we've got a context of what's happening now. Exactly. We don't stand before God and said. Father, I don't need Jesus. I stand here in my own good, righteous self. I've only lived a sinless life. I'm perfect and holy in all my ways. We don't ever stand before God and say that, do we? We don't stand in our righteousness. What we say is, Father, I acknowledge I was born in sin and conceived in iniquity. I was born with a terminal sin condition that I didn't choose. And this condition that I've had from my birth has had many symptoms. We call those sins. I've come up short. I've been sick, sick of heart, sick of mind, lived in fear, made many bad choices based on those. I'm self-centered, fearful, acted against your law. I have no ability to change my heart. The leopard can't change its spots. I can't change my heart. I can't heal my condition, Lord. I confess I'm dead and trespass and sin, dying. I'm only here before you because Jesus overcame. As the representative head, second Adam of my species, where I could never overcome. And his victory he offers me as a free gift, and I've accepted, and I have a new heart and right spirit that I didn't earn and I didn't create. It was gifted to me by your son, and it indwells me by your spirit. And then notice, as this is what we say before the Father, we don't meet the charges. We depend wholly on the victory of Christ to stand there. And notice the next words. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser with the mighty arguments of Calvary. Again, for all who acknowledge their condition, Jesus pleads effectively to them. My grace is sufficient for you. I have engraved you upon the palms of my hand. My victory is your victory. Trust me, and I will make you whole. The accusations of Satan that you are too sinful to be saved are vanquished. My plea will win you if you listen to me. Amen. Then continue on the quote, his perfect obedience to God's law, even unto death of the cross, has given him all power in heaven and earth, and he claims of his father, mercy and reconciliation for, guilt, for guilty man. Whose mercy? Whose mercy? The father's. Is the father's mercy, folks. Get your mind around that. He's not claiming something and instilling in the father. The father is merciful, and he's claiming the mercy of the father, for God so loved the world. And it was from the mercy of the father that God sent his son to be our savior. Continue on, the accuser of his people declares, the, to the accuser of his people, he declares, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. These are the purchase of my blood, brands plucked from the burning. Jesus doesn't plead his blood to the Father. Jesus rebukes Satan and refutes his accusation in our hearts and minds so that we know that despite our shortcomings, he has no power over us. We've been redeemed. Those who rely upon him in faith receive the comforting assurance, behold, 
I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with, with a change of raiment. This is who Jesus is speaking to, you and me. Yes, your wicked, corrupt character is what you had before you came to me, but I have given you a new heart and a right spirit. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Through God's grace, we get a change, and we are changed to be holy and righteous beings. And I'm going to stop there. That's, there's another paragraph that actually highlights this even more, but we are really over time. Understand that the intercessions of Jesus in heaven are the intercessions of Jesus, the right hand of God. And this is a whole other thing to do a little study on. The right hand of God, I will hold you by my righteous right hand. The right hand, Jesus stands at the right hand of God. Whenever you read about the right hand of God, that's Jesus, okay? Jesus is the right hand, the action agent, the one who, who moves in God's uh, purposes in linear existence, in reality, in time. Jesus is the one who acts out the will of the Father. And just as Jesus said, of myself, I do nothing. I do nothing of myself. I am acting out the will of my Father. I'm carrying out his purposes. When you see me, you've seen the Father because he's the right hand of the Father. He's carrying out the will and purpose of the Father. And so everything you see in Jesus, it's the thoughts and, and will of the Father made audible and visible to us. Amen. And Satan hates it. What he wants you to believe is the Father's against you and you got Jesus pleading for you. Yeah. It's a lie. Anybody who says that, they don't know him. Wow. They just know about him. And what they know is they know the Roman version with the imperial law lie. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you are good, that the word was in the beginning, was with God and was God. And all things were made by him. Nothing was made by him. Nothing has been made that has been made that wasn't made through him. And we thank you that the word became flesh and dwelt among us to reveal the truth to us that we could never have understood or seen. We ask your spirit to take and connect all these points of of reality that Jesus has revealed, that we can see the truth of your character and that we can be enlightened and we can be empowered to take this message to the world. So many souls are out there hurting, dying, struggling, exhausted, burned out. They need your rest, Lord, to rest in your love, to be transformed by your presence, to be renewed and reborn and recreated. We pray that you will bless this ministry and, and our friends around the circle, that you will empower them and their communities to take this message forward, that we might see you soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.